distinguished colleagues, dear guests. My name is Dietwald Grün. In my capacity as a Wise Dean, as well as the designated Dean of the Department of Spatial Planning at TU Dortmund University, it is a pleasure for me to welcome all of you here at the occasion of the inaugural lecture of Professor Thomas Hartmann. Since 2021, Professor Hartmann is a full professor for land policy, land management, and municipal serving at the Department of Spatial Planning at this university as the successor of Professor Benjamin Davy. Thomas Hartmann is a very renowned professor with comprehensive international experience. After his PhD in 2009 on clumsy floodplains, responsive land policy for extreme floods, a topic which is still of utmost relevance, he became postdoc and since 2013, assistant professor at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. From 2018 to 2021, he was associate professor at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Besides, he was visiting professor at several other universities, among others, Czech Jan Evangelista, Prokine University in Ustina Laben, and Vienna University. His research area and expertise compromise land policies, instruments and strategy of land policy, flood risk management, resilience and water governance, as well as justice and ethics in spatial planning. So we are lucky to have such an experienced and sophisticated colleague among us affiliated to our department. Now, we are curious to learn from you, Thomas, about land policy for the new land question. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, here we are. Land policy for the land question. Uh, I would like to guide you through a couple of thoughts, and I would like to bring about four key statements evolving around the title of land policy for the new land question. The idea of this inaugural lecture is not to finish a research, it's to start a debate with all of you. And in order to do that, I will now talk for three hours, oh no, one hour. Oh. For one hour uh, about, uh, about land policy for the new land question. Uh, afterwards, uh, those of you who are here, and I would like also to welcome those um, uh, uh, joining in online, uh, but those who are here uh, are invited to join for a drink where we continue the debate. There will be no official uh, Q&A after the talk, but there will be a room for discussion and debate, hopefully, um, afterwards. So, land policy for the new land question. And the most important um, question now raised in many of your heads is probably, what is this new land question I'm talking about? Let me first, start, first talk about the new land question and then try to oppose it to the old, the traditional, the still existing land question. So what's new? And I invite you to join me to look at what's happening at our cities. Our cities, not only in Germany and in Europe, but almost all around the globe. What we are seeing is a, um, a time of an immense re-urbanization, a massive urbanization, more and more people streaming into our cities, searching places to live, leading to increasing prices, less affordability, land markets ex explode, prices really rise to an enormous level. And this creates a huge pressure to our cities. We see that in many countries, not only the Netherlands, but also in Germany and other countries, Poland and, and other, other areas, there are huge city extensions planned to a degree that the big thinkers like Ebenezer Howard and others would not have dreamt of. We are experiencing an age of urban growth. 
This sounds amazing, doesn't it? And if you are into land policy and economics, you see the land prices coming up, right? Um, and of course, the, one of the key elements of this urban growth, the key, um, the, the key land use is housing. And you might guess it already, housing takes place on land and we need that land to accommodate housing. Or in other words, housing is basically a land question. Uh, end of talk. No, not really, obviously. Housing is a land question. And, and we're in desperate need of developing more and more space for uh, urban dwellers to live on. Affordable housing, housing for the rental sector, the middle segment even. But at the same time, we try to protect our precious landscapes. Urban confinement is at stake. So we want to confine urban, de urban development and not, we don't want urban sprawl anymore. Uh, we want the compact city. Densification is one of the key words. In order to protect our landscapes, to protect it, to, to protect it for environmental reasons, um, for touristic reasons, for agricultural reasons. And in different countries, you will find different narratives for protection. And I would like to what I consider a very strong narrative for urban confinement. And it might not come as a surprise. It has to do with rivers. Um, what we see is that we have settlements along the rivers, um, people settling with the huge cities now for, for centuries along the, the large streams. Um, just for analytical reasons, let's separate an upstream and a downstream party with, with, uh, with actors in these cities. And what happens is we see that uh, in, 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 in climate change, not nowadays we experience drought, but in other times we experience extreme flood events. It rains in the hinterland, the water masses then uh, go downstream and inundate our precious cities and, 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 uh, and facilitations. And, this, of course, creates damage, and we want, we want to avoid that. The good news is this is not a new development. This happened centuries ago, and we, had, we, had, we, have, we have done something. We built dikes to defend our cities, right? And we did that all along the catchment. Wonderful, big constructions by engineers. The result of it, by the way, is that we narrowed down the riverbed. A, a bit of basic hydraulics. If you do that, the, the result is that the water masses increase, the water level increase, uh, and downstream you get even more severe flooding. And this becomes even more extreme once we experience more extreme events and more um, extreme climate conditions. So what to do? So we have our settlements along the rivers and streams and, and creeks and we want to protect them. And Lenka in her earlier talk today um, already pointed at the solution. And the good news is we know exactly what to do. Engineering wise, it's not very, very complicated. This is what the civil engineers and the hydrologists keep telling me. What we need is we need to implement uh, certain measures to avoid inundations. And that starts in the hinterland with measures you would barely recognize as water, water retention or as, uh, as civil engineering measures at all, they look some, in part very small. But these measures take place on private land, agricultural land, forest land, and we need to get this land, get access to the land. So we can do something in the hinterland, but that's not all, not all we can do. There's more good news coming. We can um, build huge retention polders along the rivers and have controlled floodings of these areas in order to avoid disaster. Huh. But this land is usually used by farmers and other land users very intensively. This is the valuable land close to the rivers, close to the main transport corridors, and we need to realize measures on private land. And yeah, we know it actually, this is not sufficient. So at some point, um, what we need is cities that are adapted to flooding because we cannot avoid it all. Floating homes, uh, elevated buildings, that would be the dream, right? Um, 
Well, but let me tell you, they take place on private land or uh, yeah, floating homes. Here's a question of what is that actually? Is that land policy still or water management? Well, this would be the ideal situation, but the reality is that we're dealing with private land that is existing and getting landowners to realize measures to, to make resilient, to create resilient cities is one of the big challenges. Uh, today, one of the, the, the couple of researchers are here to study that. Um, Stephen Forrest is here, Karin Snell worked on, on exactly this topic. Um, and this is a challenge. Private land, we need, for, we need to deal with the extreme events that we are facing in, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, with climate change. So in short, what we can say is climate adaptation is a land question. Huh. Second time, okay? So housing is a land question. Climate adaptation is a land question. Uh, of course, we, we, we discussed that in this network, land for flood, where we did exactly that. That's the part for the commercial break. Um, so um, land for flood is, is, is really what, um, uh, where we try to figure out how this relation between climate adaptation, flood risk management, and land policy works. It's even confirmed in the recent uh, report of the, um, of the IPCC, um, where it's stated um, that uh, room for the rivers uh, can indeed uh, reduce uh, the, um, the impact of flooding. Um, so we have these two competing land policy objectives, urban growth on the one side, the need to accommodate the urban dwellers, and the need for preservation, reduction of land consumption, preserve our precious landscapes. From an economic perspective, it's no wonder that it seems that urban growth seems to win this fight of two um, objectives. But climate adaptation seems to come to help. And it seems to be a strong uh, argument to, to not grow into the landscapes. So it seems that many policymakers and also planners found the holy grail, the solution to it, and that is densification. Use the, the space within the urban areas more intensely, build more areas in the existing urban realm, build higher in these areas. So densification would be a good solution, wouldn't it? And we are so happy to find that until we start realizing densification. Because then we recognize we're dealing with property rights. We're dealing with fragmented land ownerships. And it comes out that densification, you guess it, is a land question. The land question, I mentioned it now three times, for the housing, for climate adaptation, and, uh, and for densification. How does that fit to let's call it the old land question for a moment. Traditionally, the land question comes out of a, of a time of industrialization um, where um, uh, the increase in land rent and planning gain was perceived as unfair. Big thinkers like Henry George uh, or Adolf Damaschke, and there are many more, um, discussed how to redistribute this land rent, this increase in value because it was perceived as being unjust, unfair. The old land question, you, might, well, you, you can say, is pretty much triggered and pretty much about the distribution of land rent. Distribution is the key trigger of the traditional, the old land question. But by the way, fun fact, um, uh, Andreas Hengstemann in his PhD work that worked it out, he, he asked the question, what, what is then the land question? Can I find it somewhere? Uh, and at least in German literature, you, you didn't find it. There is no literal question. I looked at it for the English uh, and I could not find the one land question. It's more a land issue, a topic, but it evolves about the distribution of land rent. The new land question is much more driven and triggered by questions of allocation. We're now dealing with a situation where we deal with 
densification, the need to densify in order to accommodate urban growth. At the same time, we want to preserve our landscapes and implement climate adaptation. Of course, these issues are relevant for the distribution, who gets what, who pays for it. But they are driven by the idea to realize certain land uses on the scarce resource of land. And this is the first statement I invite you to discuss with me, not only today, but over the next years, I tend to say decades. Um, land policy is on the, on the new land, the, the land policy for the new land question is on allocation. The new, um, the new land question is on allocation. There are urgent questions evolving around this and I pointed at a couple of them. Good news. The um, policymakers recognize this. The German uh, Ministry for the Interior Building and Homeland uh, a couple of years ago, they recognized that there is a ur an urgent need for more housing. Though they established an expert commission on the long-term, I don't read it out, it's the Building Land Commission. Um, they established a Building Land Commission to deal with this urgent, urgent question, releasing reports uh, in these reports, uh, claiming important changes in the way in Germany land policy has to be done. Uh, active land policy should be done, planning should be made much more easier, avoiding bureaucratic hurdles, uh, uh, using long-term strategic, uh, 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 long-term leases, um, and many, many more. Quite progressive recommendations in that report. If you want to summarize it in a catchphrase, I would say the catchphrase is the, 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 the Building Land Commission recommends to the public authorities, the municipalities, have more control of land, towards more control of land. The way to do that usually is with new instruments of land policy. Almost all these discussions, and we don't, do not only have them in Germany, there is a legal reform ongoing in the Czech Republic. Recently, there was a change of, in, in, in Switzerland. There is a change going on in Belgium, in the Netherlands. We see them all over the place, and it looks like um, if there is a planning problem, the policymakers react and create new instruments or strengthen existing instruments of land policy. This is also what Germany did. So they came up with a, with a, with a draft of a, of, a, um, um, of a new planning law, and they created and strengthened uh, instruments of land policy. I found it quite interesting that Germany did that on its own. While in neighboring countries, many of the instruments that have been, have been strengthened, I will not go into all detail, but there are experiences in neighboring countries with exactly the things that the German Building Land Commission recommended. But they didn't look there. They looked in Ger to Germany because it's a very special situation. This is what every country is saying. Um, triggered by this thought, um, Andreas Hengstermann and I launched a, an expert group uh, of land policies in Europe, where we now look at in total 11 countries and look how they are dealing with land policy. The punchline here is in all of the countries, we seem to have the tendency towards more control of land by the public authorities. And usually this is done with new instruments, new instruments of land policy. Th th this is very short and, and, and generalizing, but you, you can see this trend all over. There is a planning problem emerging, new instruments happening. Earlier, a couple of years back, Jean-David uh, Gerber, Andreas and I, we made a huge endeavor and we looked at instruments of land policy. We've uh, looked at 11 instruments in different countries. Um, I will not go into too much detail. You will, will for sure have read or will read the book of instruments of land policy. Um, and we looked at the different instruments and we let authors describe them in their respective country, uh, reference land values in Germany. Winrich Voss is here, he wrote this, this piece actually, negotiated land use plans, uh, where's Jos Tenikas? You wrote that, that piece. Uh, and, and many more, land banking, Theo Spitt was the author of that bit. Um, and then we asked authors from two different countries to comment on that. And in a nutshell, the takeaway of this book is there are instruments, they are used in different countries very differently, but they are always presented 
in a very functionalist way by the, by the different uh, member states. The selection of land policy instruments is often presented as a, as a very functionalist approach, um, as if the, the choices for or against a certain instrument merely depends on technical, bureaucratic, or administrative choices. And this is what you experience when you talk with practitioners in land policy. You will hear sentences like, yeah, well, we do land readjustment because we always did, or we do uh, active land policy because that's, that's our tradition here. And then if there is a planning problem coming up, we see that there is a planning re reform and the practitioners often do not apply these new instruments. The introduction of new instruments for individual planning problems bears a risk of institutional complexity traps. This is out of a uh, viewpoint piece that's coming out in town planning review that Sebastian Dembski, Andreas Hengstermann, and Richard Dunning, uh, together with me, author. And it describes something that we denominate as instrumental activism. There is a planning problem in your city. Well, invent a new planning instrument. And you see that all over the place. And sometimes there, there are very good examples. But if you look around, what happens and how planning law reforms are triggered, quite often there's a specific planning problem that needs to be solved. And then the planning law is adjusted or existing on instruments are increased. As if the mere introduction of new instrument would lead to the application of it. In practice, however, we see that the introduction of new instrument does not necessarily lead to an application of, su of such instruments in practice. What policymakers seem to fail to see is the reasons behind applying certain instruments. The student project uh, Land for Housing looked on the way instruments are applied by, um, uh, by planning authorities. And I think we need to better understand even with new institutionalists approaches, how and why planning authorities en enact certain instruments and disregard others. And I know there are certain constraints, not always for every planning problem, you have all the instruments available. And I know that Ben and I, we had a debate on that, on the principle of proportionality. But in fact, what you, what you see quite often is that there is a choice of instruments and we need to question these choices. And it would be necessary to think strategically about what instruments needs to be used in which way. So if you want, that's my next claim. Strategic land policy is necessary instead of instrumental activism. Not every planning problem needs new instruments, which is not saying that every planning law reform is unnecessary or bad, but we need to think about it. If you want to engage in more debates on that, you have the second product placement, so to speak. Um, join the debate of the International Academic Association of, on Planning Law and Property Rights, of which I may be the acting president. The next conference, in, conference is in May next year in Ann Arbor, uh, www.plpr-association.org, memberships free. Um, and engage in the debate to explore strategic land policy and explore what happens with instrumental activism, as I would like to call it. So the second statement of the day. Strategic land policy for the new land question, instead of instrumental activism, well, but how? How do we do that? What, what, what are the key ingredients? Let me take you to one of my favorite pictures of land policy. Ustin Labem. It's a small city uh, north in Czech Republic, just between Dresden and Prague. If you're on the way, you have to stop. It's a wonderful uh, little town. You see the city center here. Um, and I, I don't give too many context details, but the site I'm talking about is this very site next to this triangular spot in the city center. The triangular spot is, a, is the central marketplace. And there is a brown field, a stalled site. And guess what? The planners had a fantastic idea. Let's build a shopping center. And this is actually the best place integrated in the city center on a brownfield next to a market. What better conditions can you dream of for a shopping center? And this is the site. Um, 
and it's actually very nice integrated into an, an area which is which is more a young uh, I'm not sure if students are really living there but it looks like a gentrifying area with with very nice buildings so the landowner of this stalled site he said well okay let's do a shopping center and he started digging and building the parking garage already um, and then he said, you know what, uh, but I want a bit of more land here uh, for the cafes and entrance and to, to, to make it all more vivid. And the city said, no, no, that's public land, you cannot have it. So the landowner said, okay, then I leave it as it is. I think it's almost 20 years ago, the stalled site. This is a puzzling thing for me. From a land economics perspective, you cannot understand that. And from a public policy perspective, you cannot understand why I would not force this landowner to do that. Why is this my favorite site? Because it tells you a lot about planning. You can have fantastic ideas, building a shopping center, making spatial visions and analysis. But if you forget one important layer in the game, you cannot implement it. And that important layer is the, import, is the layer of property rights. Um, there's a very nice quote that summarizes much better than I could do. It goes like that. It's not the one owning, uh, not the one building the flat. It's not the one owning the house, but it's the one who owns the land who decides the development of our cities. And the landowner in Ustine Laban did exactly that. That quote, by the way, is from a book um, by Hans Bernoulli. It's in the opening of Hans Bernoulli's book. It's not by himself, um, but it's, it's in the opening. It's from 1946. Hans Bernoulli was a Swiss architect and a land reformer. And he opened his book on, with, with this sentence. Um, we actually put it also in the Instruments of Land Policy book quite, quite up front. Why is that quote so important and struggling for me? It's the second part of this quote. Who owns the land decides the development of our cities. We are today at the largest, one of the largest, oh, don't, don't want to fight, the largest planning school in Europe. Um, I'm teaching planners, inspire them to dream of better cities and futures. And then this quote comes along and tells me, you planners? You don't decide, it's the landowners who decide the development of our cities. Oh, that's puzzling, isn't it? How can I motivate planners then? To me, this quote, in essence, uh, brings together the idea of private property and public, uh, the public interest. Um, and between property and planning, the private interest and the public interest, the issue of the land question emerges. Now, some of you might say now, but we have planning, we have planning instruments, we have institutions for that. We can deal with that in planning, right? Can we? We have wonderful planning systems with multiple tiers with preparatory land use plans, zoning or land use plans, however you call it in your system, regional planning, uh, national planning sometimes, European directives helping us, right? Isn't that great? Regional planning helping us? local land use plans, and then we put the planners in buildings like that. You feel compassion, you, you feel sorry. Um, this is a very functionalist building. This is actually the, 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 the planning department in Ludwigshafen, uh, uh, in my home region. Um, how can we do that? Property rights are amongst the best thing that you can own, They're very well protected in the European of human rights and the institution we set in order to deal with property we put with very few resources and a couple of instruments this is this is puzzling to me still i want to encourage land uh, encourage not landowners i want to encourage the planners but here is here's the dilemma look at this picture this is, this is a, um, a wonderful floodplain close to uh, Magdeburg at the River Elbe. And it would be a fantastic site to store water, a retention site, right? Until you realize next to it, there's been a planner. 
developing a, a nice area uh, for young families to live on. And how do we do that usually? Usually the planner assigns property rights, the right to develop to the landowner without any expiration date. One can develop. Planning on the other side, if we look at the time dimension of planning, well, planning has very good methods to forecast what happens over the next couple of weeks, months, years, potentially. For the next decades, we work with scenarios. I'm very happy. Michael, Michael Wegener is here today. I remember your method classes back then when, we, when you taught us about the methods in planning that we use. Scenario techniques is, are, is one of them. But even with the best methods at hand, we need to admit at some point it's pure guessing. Who would be able to tell us how the city looks in 100 years, in 80 years, 50 years potentially? This is very tricky. But property rights don't have an expiration date like other products have. And if, if, if you consider that, we, this is a bit odd, right, isn't it? So we assign property rights, the right to develop to landowners. It's a gift, develop, get rich. And we can only forecast so much. This is really puzzling to me. And when I first recognized that, I thought, huh, there must be some theory about that. Planning theory needs to look at it. And if you look at literature, there is a vast amount of planning theory literature looking at the trouble of forecasting. And they suggest experimental and participatory approach and stakeholder involvement approaches, um, experimental um, co-evolution, um, and, and so on. Many of them stressing the need for flexibility in planning. But the more I look at it, the less I found interesting or not interesting, but relevant um, um, literature that deals with this tension between planning and property. I hope not too many planning theorists are here today, but sometimes it looks a bit like planning theory lost ground, building castles in the sky. And if I want to say something to planning theory, find your fundament. We're dealing with property, property in land. Planning theory should help us to deal with property in land properly, because otherwise we cannot properly plan. Or to put it in the more practical phrase as my third statement of today, land policy for the new land question needs to understand landowners as key stakeholders, not merely as a recipient of your plan, or one stakeholder that needs to be involved in the participatory approach. No, the landowner is a key stakeholder that we need to take seriously and we need to understand the different types of landowners, the different rationalities of landowners. I'm so grateful for the student project that you did the first step in that. So that is the third statement I would like to throw at you today. So that leaves us with the last one. I promised four, right? So here we go. Land policy. Um, I'm talking about land policy all the time without saying, what, what, what is that? Is that the same as planning? Is that something different? What is land policy? Th that's the, the a very fundamental question to understand how land policy for the new question could work. Land policy, um, I would like to define uh, right now following. Uh, the following sentence. Land policy are public interventions to influence the allocation and distribution of land. That, that, that sounds pretty clear and simple, doesn't it? We need to unpack it. Public interventions to influence the allocation and distribution of land. Let me talk about four elements in that definition that to me are very essential to understand land policy. The first point is land policy is a public intervention, which, which incorporates a public authority using public money, power, or trust to influence what's happening on land, not a private endeavor. That's the first important notion, and it, because it's public, that needs to be legitimized democratically. Otherwise, it would be illegitimate. 
the second important element of that definition, um, land policy um, entails interventions. An intervention is only necessary if it would not happen without the intervention. It follows a certain purpose, a certain objective. And in order to make sense, this intervention needs to be as effective as possible in achieving the desired objective. The public requires legitimacy. Intervention requires effectiveness. The allocation, the allocation is the question how land is used. Is it a shopping center, a park, or uh, a roller coaster? Um, it's a question of what, what, what is planned where? And because land is a scarce resource, we cannot waste it. An economist would tell us that the best way to not waste a scarce resource is to use it as efficient as possible. So efficiency, I'm talking about allocative efficiency here, is a key requirement of land policy. Which brings us to the fourth one, uh, kind of it's my favorite one, and that's the distribution part. I told you earlier that the, earlier that the new land question is about is on allocation but of course it had has used huge implication for the distribution the distribution of land this is about the question who pays and who benefits it's about issues of justice so here we are four elements um, of this of this short definition leading to four key criteria of land policy and they are effectiveness efficiency legitimacy and justice. Allow me to take a couple of minutes to run through each of these major concepts in a ridiculously short amount of time. Ready? Here we go. Effectiveness. Effectiveness, barely and simple, plain and simple, is actually um, uh, measured against a certain planning objective. Imagine you want to build eight row houses, and you build eight row houses. Then you can consider this this policy that led to this eight row houses a very effective one. If you fail in realizing the eight row houses, and you have gaps. You can consider that either as less effective, or you could even say that that, that is a more flexible approach. I'm not sure whether that's a euphemism, but it, it's more flexible against more effective. If you think about it, we should actually not be, 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 it should not be necessary to talk about these issues, shouldn't it? It should, be, it should be crystal clear that if we make a plan, it will be implemented. Well, is it self-evident? Let me show you a board I found it back in 2013 in Portland, Oregon at a PLPR conference. The city district, Found, found it necessary to point out with a metal sign that they planned something and it actually worked. Isn't that sad? I mean, that should be self-evident, right? So it is not self-evident that a plan that we, that we planned actually works out. Look at the case of Ustinad Labem. Um, I, I sense that I need to add more sentence to the Dutch colleagues who live in a world where they can actually implement a lot, at least they couldn't in the past if we uh, believe Andreas Faludi's work um, on, on the Dutch planning doctrine, but that was actually 30 years ago. Effectiveness is actually uh, measured in realizing the choosing planning aims. Edwin Bautela and Barry Needham wrote that in this second edition of a book, Planning Law and Eco Economics, uh, Barry is here and Edwin are here. I'm very happy that, that, that I've, I've seen both of you. I feel so honored that we, that we could work on this project. And effectiveness um, needs always to be measured against the planning aims. And if we translate that to land policy and apply our definition I just pr put forward, then um, these planning aims should be on, or are often on, or are on the distribution or the allocation of land. Examples for the distribution of land, and this is of course an incomplete list, is uh, financing public purposes, redistributing wealth in order to achieve social justice, or reduce speculations on land. This would be typical planning objectives uh, focusing on the distribution uh, of land, who pays, who gets the land rent. Um, whereas typical objectives on the allocation would be the, the, the steering of a sp certain spatial development to pursue spatial objectives like, I don't, don't know, a socially mixed housing area or to preserve precious landscapes. 
I told you earlier that the allocation is now uh, central in the new land question, uh, but the distributional aspect is following um, as a consequence of focusing on allocation. But what I would like to talk about effectively, and I need to, need to cut it short here, is when we think about land policy, we need to explicitly ask what is the public policy goal of land policy. And oftentimes in, in the implementation of planning, we seem to forget that because we load goal after goal to, to a plan. And we need to be very clear about what the public policy goal of land policy. We need to understand that. And the public policy goal of the new land question often focuses on the allocation of land. I brought the examples of urban growth versus preservation and climate adaptation coming to help to preservation and densification um, as the often perceived holy grail to uh, how to solve the riddle. Efficiency is the second criteria I would like to talk about. I'm not talking about procedural efficiency. Uh, Barry Needham in one of the books on, on active land, uh, on, on land policy in the Netherlands, uh, land use planning in the Netherlands, uh, he concluded that we barely look at the procedural efficiency of planning because we barely ask how much does the planner cost, how much time has been, been used up. We barely do that. And I don't want to do that today as well, although it's not an unimportant question. But I would like to, to talk about allocative efficiency. So the question of the relation between land market and land uses. F famous thinkers like von Thunen, but also Alonso taught us how land rent, the, the, the price of land, simply speaking, um, determines or controls, steers what land use is taking place at which location leading to city structures where we have a central business district, commercial areas outside, and then living areas and so on and so forth. I don't want to dive too much into theory here, but what I find fascinating, and this is where I think uh, I can uh, motivate our planners to, to, to work on that, is that by using planning law, we are changing land markets. We are changing the land rent. And sometimes we work with the land market when we, when we uh, realize a certain development area in an area that the market also wants to implement. Uh, and sometimes we distort the market and try to, to avoid that the market um, prevails. Ask yourself why Central Park New York is still a park. The real estate sector cannot explain that. Planning law can explain that. And here we see that with using planning, planning law and influencing property rights, we are actively changing the shape of our cities. And this bears a lot responsibility to our planners. The riddle still is why that in Usti failed, in Usti nad Labem, uh, but that's, that's something to discuss later. So for efficiency, um, if you want to, pay, to put it into a nutshell, um, the central question to me is how does land policy affect the land markets? More theoretically speaking, the land rent and the land markets uh, are, are then a follow-up. So, um, but this is really important for me if you think about instruments of land policy and how to apply them strategically. A key question I would ask a planner in this situation is how does it affect the land market? Does it work with or against the land market or the land markets? We cannot go much further here, but let's, let's move on with the next one. Legitimacy. So I, I, I said that land policy is a public intervention and that entails uh, that it needs uh, a, 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 a certain legitimacy because we're dealing with property rights, we're intervening in rights of landowners. P political science tells us that there are different concepts how to, um, how to legitimize certain activities. I will not go too much into detail, just so much. There is a traditional distinction between input and output legitimacy. Input being um, a way of legitimacy where an action of a state is, is accepted by the general public because it's legitimized by the institutions that stand behind, because we have an election and institutions that follow. Uh, let me give you an example. If I will send out letters to all of you uh, telling you to send a huge amount of money, you might throw it away, sadly. Um, but if the tax office will send the same letter, you're inclined to pay. 
without often asking how the tax office will use that money. Why are you doing that? Because the tax office is, is legitimized as an input legitimacy. It's a certain institution that we honor and res honor, we respect. Let's stick to respect for a moment. Output legitimacy, on the other hand, justifies a public policy intervention by the result it, ach it achieves. Certain amount of workplaces, certain amount of housing infrastructure, ha um, creating uh, affordable housing and so forth. You might recognize this is very common in spatial planning. We're using that implicitly very often without being aware of it. Um, Vivian Schmidt later on uh, suggested a third form, which is called throughput legitimacy, which is a form where we accept a public intervention because a certain process has been followed. Um, the German institution of land readjustment would be a prime example where we follow a certain procedure. This procedure is accepted and therefore legitimized. I don't, didn't want, I didn't intend to give a lecture on public policy science, so I should stop here. The key point I want to raise here is um, when we want to understand land policy and design land policy for the new land question, we need to ask ourselves how, how the land policy is legitimized. Is it more like the tax office? Is it like the workspaces or is it like the throughput legitimacy? And for different planning problems, you need different forms of legitimacy. And what form you have influences the strategy of land policy you need to apply. Are you still with me? So a, a last one. Okay. Um, I, I promised for a run through all the four criteria, which is a huge run. So here comes actually, I think one of my favorite ones, and that is on justice. Justice is about the question who, who pays and who, uh, and who benefits, or more theoretically spoken, who owns the land rent? Who owns the, the, the money that's made out of land? The land rent. And in different situations, in different, uh, in different countries, this question is answered differently. When I studied land policy, I sat in your class, Ben, I learned this sentence, the plan belongs to the landowner. And the landowner is the one getting, getting rich by the planner designating land. This question is answered differently in different systems. In the Netherlands, the municipality captures the planning gain to a huge extent. It's not really true also the big development com companies and so on, but I'm not talking about this right now. Um, but the question gets interpreted differently in the different countries, in the different land policies, and even within a country, it's relevant when you decide which strategy of land policy to apply, which instrument you use, because they have in here built in mechanisms on distributing the land rent. Oh, isn't that great? We can talk about distributing wealth, whether this person get rich or that person get rich. We should not forget that this is a normative question, a political question, who should own the land rent. This was the debate by the big land reformers, Henry George, Adolf Damaschke, Hans Bernoulli, even Isa Howard, um, who should own the land rent. But they're all talking about this profit. We should not forget to also talk about the risk of the land rent. Why that? Well, I was, I was in the Netherlands when the real estate crisis hit back in 2008, which was denominated an economic crisis. It was a real estate crisis. It started as a real estate crisis. Many cities in the Netherlands were hugely affected and went bankrupt because they behaved like real estate developers. They, they took the risk of land rent. So who should own the land rent is a hugely normative question that we should not take too easy. We could take it up to the big philosophers like Jeremy Bentham, who would probably have said that, uh, that the land rent should be used to serve the majority of the people or uh, Milton Friedman, uh, who would stress that the land rent should belong to the landowner or John Rawls, that land rent belongs to everybody. And what we see here is that there are different interpretations, um, philosophies, but also practical consequences on the question who should own the land rent. To me, these four criteria describe very nicely 
that land policy in essence is not neutral. Land policy depends on specific interpretations of effectiveness, efficiency, legitimacy, and you guessed it, justice. Land policy in other words, it is not neutral. It corresponds to specific interpretations of the role of the state and private actors. Land policy corresponds to specific interpretations of the role of the state and private actors. That's the picture we had earlier. Landowners and public interests represented by planning. Land policy provides the answer to the land, but that means understanding land policy as a normative public policy. It's not a bureaucratic, bureaucratic act. It's not a, not a mere technology. It's a normative public policy, which is the fourth statement I would like to throw at you today. It's a long day, so let's recap. Four statements made. First, the new land question is on allocation. Second, strategic land policy for the new land question needs to understand landowners as the key stakeholders. And we need strategic land policy instead of instrumental activism. What do I mean by the strategic? Using these four criteria that, that, that built uh, that, that, that we just discussed, efficiency, effectiveness, legitimacy, and justice, to decide on the use of the right instruments in the right case. And fourth, it's a normative public policy. It's a political normative debate. We should not forget it. It's policy. So that's what I want to talk, to tell you today about land policy for the new land question. Um, I would like to thank you for listening, but also I want to thank the following five persons in particular who played a major role in the build up to these arguments and the development of this career. Hans Heinrich Blotevogel is the first person. Hans Heinrich Blotevogel was my PhD, uh, my diploma thesis or master thesis supervisor, if you want. Um, and he was the one after finalizing my, um, uh, my, my thesis, he said to me, you should consider to do a PhD. This was not on my plan until then. And even if it was not him, I would not have visited then Ben and told him about my idea to talk about flood risk management and land policy. Also, Hans Heinrich Blotevogel, um, he uh, gave me very good career advice on the way. His best advice, I would give it here right away. Um, when I left Germany to the Netherlands, he said, watch your German network. You might need it once you might, might want to come back. I'm so grateful for that advice. Ben Davy is, of course, uh, a former boss here in Dortmund, um, but in particular, my PhD supervisor. Um, ben managed to trigger my passion for property and for, for land policy. Um, I met Ben first in a class back in 1999. Um, and that when, I, when I heard the stories, I thought, oh, this, this is nice, professor. That would be good. So I'll, I would like to become a professor, but who am I to become a professor? I'm the first in my family who ever studied. How can I, how can I dare? And then I thought, huh, why am I thinking that? Let's try to find out who stops me. <laughs> Nobody did. So Ben triggered this passion. And I would like to thank you, Ben, for the, your trust in flood risk management indeed as a topic, which nobody would question nowadays. And also for introducing me to planning law and property rights. And I had the honor to meet many of you. And Rachel, you heard, uh, you heard Rachel earlier, um, who, which was a major influence to my career. Second person, now the third. My second PhD supervisor is Barry Needham. Barry Needham encouraged me to, to do research internationally and in English. Uh, I met Barry Needham at a PhD workshop back in, um, in Bristol. And I remember at the point I was writing down every line I wanted to, to say, we trained it in your office, Ben. Um, 
And after, after that, we went to, for a beer in a, in a bar. And I sat next to, next to Barry. And Barry was telling me, oh, this, is, this is good research. You should publish that internationally in English. So oh, my English is not very good. I cannot do that. Ah, oh, you have to come to an English speaking environment, he was telling me, handing me over his business card. It said Nijmegen University. I said, that's not in the UK. Anyway, he convinced me to come over. And he did not only encourage me to publish in English and to do my PhD in English, and he did not only triggered my passion and love for Dutch academia and the Netherlands, but he also taught me to challenge Ben. <laughs> then there is Theo Spitz. Theo is uh, my, my first boss in the Netherlands. Um, I was done with my PhD. Um, but Theo kind of mentored me towards this way uh, to the professorship. And one of the most important things amongst man many life lessons I've heard from Theo, and those of you who know him know what life lessons uh, you can learn from him. But one of the key passions I've learned from him is the passion for PhD supervision and supporting young academics. He, he, when I was in his office one of the first time, he said to me, Thomas, you need to learn to use me to develop your career. That sentence sticks to me and I try to make others, to enable others to use me and my network and my knowledge and my, my expertise to develop your career. Finally, I would like to thank um, Yurina Yilkova. She recently passed away, unfortunately. She's uh, in Ustinad Labem, or she was in Ustinad Labem, um, the vice dean for research. And she's the one actually bringing together Lenka and me to set up this network on land for flood. Um, she really um, believed in me and supported me in the, in the, on my way to the career. So I would like to thank these five persons in particular and many of those who I forgot to mention because of the ridiculous short, shortness of time, but there are many more which I should have mentioned right away, but I didn't. Um, and I think this is the moment to tell the story of the Thai. You might have recognized, uh, Edwin once told me at a conference when he wants to point out who is Thomas, he always points to, that's the, that's the one with the Thai. And you would not wear usually ties in academia. I might look around. I do. Why is that? The trick is not the tie. The trick is the tie clip. I'm the first person in my family to ever um, go, go to a university. Also the first to do a PhD and to become a professor and so forth. My parents were very proud when I graduated and I handed in my, my thesis. And they were thinking, now you're in the big world playing with the important guys. And my parents thought that wearing a tie is an expression of that. Not knowing that in academia, this is actually something that is not very common at conference. You would wear a shirt, and short shorts probably even. <laughs> unfinished trousers. Um, so they bought that tie clip to me and I found it a bit clumsy at, in the beginning. I thought, what, 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 when would I wear a tie clip? And I thought, now I would wear it. Why would I wear it? Because it reminds me of where I came from and that it, it was possible to uh, become a professor and nobody said, stop, stop to me on the way. I have a deep belief in our academic system and the institutions that, that maintain it. I know there are many flaws, peer review processes and funding and grants and many flaws, but it's the best system we have and allows us to thrive. And I would like to encourage in particular the young academics by looking at the tie clip that you can get that far. And I think this is, this, this is a message I really want to address in particular to the young academics, to the students today here. Use this academic system to thrive. And, and the tie clip is for me a reminder to that. And I'm very thankful 
for my parents uh, that they gave it to me. Unfortunately, my mother recently passed away. My father can be here today. Um, my brother and my, my uncle are also here. Um, and also, I'm also thank you, thankful for my family, my wife and kids supporting me, in particular my wife. She's a brave woman supporting me on all, the, all these years uh, going on the travels and the evenings and discussing all the time. Uh, I can tell you, if you plan to do an academic career, dear young academics and students, you might lose some friends along the way. But those who stay are the real good friends. So I would also like to thank my friends and family for supporting me on the way. And that is what I would like to talk, to, to talk today about land policy for the new land question. Thank you very much.